Okay. This meeting is being recorded. I am the state director at Sierra Club, uh, Massachusetts here, and i um, thrilled to be here, thrilled to have um, this topic, um, which was brought to me by Eric and one of your community members, Gail Greenwald. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to spend some of our time on this work. I just want to ask kind of table setting, just say, you know, we're going to ask people to stay on mute the whole time. If you have questions, please type them into the chat and we'll try to answer them as we go along and then we'll have time for Q&A and discussion afterwards. And uh, just as one of our, um, you know, just to just as a table setting Zoom, uh, um, protocol or, or norms is that, you know, if someone's talking, please don't interrupt them. And also, if you notice that you're talking a lot, maybe step back and make room for somebody else who's talking. And if you notice that you're not talking, maybe uh, step forward and say something about the issue. So again, thanks to you all so much for being here. And I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight, Eric Grunbaum, who is a resident in um, the neighborhood of Jerry's Pond. He's also one of the co-founders of Friends of Jerry's Pond. And this is the group that's been advocating to turn this, you know, kind of hidden resource into a real functioning resource for the neighborhood. Um, Eric also it, uh, works with impact investors to get um, investments made in clean tech and also along social justice lines uh, to try to get the whole investment world a little bit more justice focused, which is a big movement right now. It's part of winning the climate crisis. And he also is a recovering documentary filmmaker, actually made a film about uh, um, coal coal mining in West Virginia. So anyhow, uh, without further ado, I want to turn uh, this presentation over to Eric. Well, thank you, Deb and Jacob and everybody for attending. Um, thank you. Uh, I see some friends and uh, colleagues uh, from the neighborhood. Um, appreciate your attending. And also I, I mentioned uh, uh, already, but thanks again to Councilors Carlone and uh, Nolan uh, uh, for attending, and I don't know if there's others uh, on, I can't see the full screen, but thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, for some folks, uh, this will clearly be a, a big repeat of a lot of stuff that you know well, uh, and you've heard me talk about before. And for others, this may be uh, brand new. So I think I'm going to probably start at the beginning. Uh, and, uh, and also just to be clear, uh, there's a, we're talking about a 26, I think almost 27 acre site. Uh, and the part that I'm really focusing on uh, and that Friends of Jerry's Pond is really focusing on is the Jerry's Pond part of the site. And I'll explain, I'll show you that in a little bit more detail uh, once I start sharing slides, which I will do now. Uh, here we go. So hopefully this will appear for everybody. Is it, give me a thumbs up and, and I'll know that it's there. Okay, good. Um, so uh, the, uh, the site that we're talking about, well, for, first of all, Friends of Jerry's Pond was uh, founded uh, uh, about six years ago, it was 2015. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we founded it because we noticed, uh, even after living here for years, that there was this site that was more or less uh, hidden, basically hidden in plain sight. Uh, it was a, a huge amount of land, a, a pit, uh, as, as neighbor locals uh, call it, Jerry's Pit, and, and Jerry's Pond, as, as we learned, first learned of it. Uh, uh, and so we started thinking about how can we take this pit uh, and, and turn it into something better? Uh, is there a better future for, for Jerry's Pit? Uh, will it always be a pit? Uh, will it always be fenced off? Uh, we really didn't know that much about the history until we started uh, looking into it. Um, and uh, I'll give you a brief overview of some of that history, uh, what the conditions are like today, what we're imagining the future could be. Uh, the developer, uh, which is called IQHQ, uh, lab developer, uh, uh, their proposals, which we think can be improved. And I just want to caveat that right now and just say that IQHQ has been really great to deal with. Uh, they've been an, an incredible partner We've been meeting with them regularly and there's a lot of good stuff happening. And so uh, this is not a critique of IQHQ. It's really about reaching for something even better. Uh, I'll mention briefly some of our community work. Uh, if, we, if we want to, I can do a bit of a deeper dive on what reshaping a wetland means uh, and also sort of the future of how we get there and bringing together the NGOs uh, and potential funding sources from state, uh, city, federal, private, 
uh, to create a world-class accessible green space and a regeneration of the natural landscape. Um, so just the overview here, where are we? Uh, and obviously low, very known to most to a lot of people, but not everybody. Uh, Jerry's Pond is this area here. That's the part of the site that we're really focusing on right next to all this active use recreation, next to the T Plaza here and the garage. And then you have the Ringe Towers, uh, two of them visible here. There's a third one uh, and Jefferson Park Housing Project. And if you, didn't, if you didn't know any better, you'd say, oh, what a beautiful uh, passive recreation natural landscape this is. Um, but what you don't see is at the ground level that it's fenced off. And it's a little hard to see that it's basically a square pit uh, with steep walls uh, from this view. So this perhaps uh, will, can be improved. Um, now, just stepping back a bit further, um, you can see uh, the Ringe Towers here. Jefferson Park is over here. That's state and federal housing projects and uh, neighborhood up here. You can see my house up there, I think in blue. Uh, the site that we're talking about, uh, the 26 or 27 acres, is Jerry's Pond. Uh, and it's all the way up here where you see the infamous W.R. Grace Company up there on the north bordered by Whittemore and on the west by El Life Brook Parkway. All of this land, uh, formerly owned by W.R. Grace, uh, then split into two companies, GCP Applied Technologies owned it, and then they sold it to IQHQ, uh, and they closed in August of last year. The only piece they don't, they, they don't actually own is this little thumb of, of the uh, T Plaza. They even own this path here, the linear path. Uh, there's a right of way for, for Cambridge, but it's, it's owned by uh, IQHQ. And here's the site. You can see basically a rectangular pit. Um, if you go back into history, you can see that it was uh, an incredibly popular swimming hole and a, a, a real relief from, uh, from the city for, for people, really working class folks in, in uh, North Cambridge at the time, uh, many from Canada um, and Ireland. Uh, and it was really a place people went uh, to seek relief from the city um, and the heat of, uh, of the day and, and the work day. Um, you can again see in the 40s, so about 20 years later, uh, you can see here's a bathhouse that the city built. Uh, and you can see again that it's basically a mine pit. Uh, and why was it a mine pit? Because there was clay here. This whole area was part of uh, what was once known as the Great Swamp. Uh, and all the way from uh, the, the Mystic River uh, to uh, uh, by, the, by way of the Alewife Brook down to Fresh Pond, it was actually saltwater tidal area. And, and you might wonder why, was, uh, why is it named after an alewife, which is a, a, saltwater, a saltwater fish that breeds in freshwater. Um, and the reason is because alewives came up here, the saltwater fish came up here. Um, these pits were dug to, to generate clay to make all the bricks that built our city. Uh, this is where they dried the, the bricks. This is where they baked them in a giant kiln. Uh, this uh, brick pit right here, I think it was called Foley's Pond. And this, was, uh, uh, this is where the Ringe Towers are now. Um, and then if you go a few more uh, uh, to the ground level really here at the same, in the same era, you can see the bathhouse here. Uh, you can see the drying sheds in the back there. Uh, and then uh, one of my favorite little uh, details on this is that somebody brought their dog down to the, to the pit uh, and, and brought their bicycles down. And this is really a, a great gathering place for people um, uh, in the city. And just to be clear, we're not proposing we bring back swimming. Uh, uh, but we are talking about uh, renaturalizing and reopening this to the public. Um, so let me see, next picture. Ah, so this is, oops, skipped one. There we go. Uh, behind us, so this is looking at the opposite view. Behind us is Rinjav now. Uh, and you can see again, hundreds of people swimming. You can see Russell Field is more or less uh, where it is today. Uh, and you can see the chemical company here on the north part of the site. Um, and uh, this is the edge of the bathhouse, probably at that point, the 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 fence had been broken off, but I'm pretty sure that's the bathhouse. And you can see again, sort of a reedy, marshy area and a great swimming hole for people. So today, what does it look like? It's basically a fenced off uh, mine pit still. Um, uh, nobody goes in there. We, you know, it's it, for safety. The fence uh, was put up uh, in 1961. I think initially probably because of uh, it was a hard place to lifeguard, too big and too uh, just too much territory for people to cover. And then years later, it was discovered that W.R. Grace was uh, polluting the site uh, and particularly on the north part of the site. And so the fence went up for safety and, and has remained up since. Um, if you look at it, uh, just looking at Ringe Ave here, you can see the Ringe Towers here. 
Uh, we, we hired an intern, part of our community work is working with the communities here. We hired an intern, uh, Anusha Alam, who lives in this house here, which is part of the affordable housing uh, connected to the Ringe Towers. Um, and then if you're looking down Ringe Ave, you can really see, this gives you a pretty good view of the fact that there's really no space for trees here, or very little. There's only about eight feet of dirt here before it drops straight into the pond. Uh, and so it's just not a very nice landscape here. You're right next to the, the cars. Uh, there's really no space, uh, minimal space for trees. And it's just a, a paved uh, and chain link fence urban uh, 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 landscape. And so what we thought about, we kind of scratched our heads a lot about this and talked to a lot of people about what could we do about this and ultimately came to the idea that if you reshaped the pond and turned basically a square into a uh, more rounded natural shape by filling on the Rinjab side and uh, expanding the pond on this side, you could create a lot more space, both for people and for ecosystem. And so you may have seen this, it's been published a couple of times, um, I believe in Cambridge Day and, and, and maybe uh, the Chronicle. Uh, but basically the idea here is if you take this land, what can you do with it? Uh, and you can create this enormous benefit for people and for and for ecosystems. So to begin with, I mentioned it's, it's a steep walled mine pit, basically. Well, if you fill in this land here and create this space, you can do uh, a naturally sloped pond bank and you can create an actual biodiverse wetland here. Um, biodiverse, because you now have aquatic plants that can grow there, that's the base of the food chain. The, uh, the insects and the macroinvertebrates uh, live in this space. Um, they feed the, the fish, the turtles, and the, and the frogs, uh, and of course the herons that we, that we love that nest uh, along the pond banks. Um, and so this creates a great ecosystem for them. Then we can put people closer to nature. And I think uh, if you haven't read the book, The Nature Fix, I highly recommend it. It's really about all of the scientific studies suggesting that, uh, or proving really that being close to nature is really sort of built into our DNA and it makes us uh, more creative and uh, happier people. Um, so putting people in nature is incredibly important. Um, it gives us the places to sit and contemplate it. It has a sidewalk, uh, uh, which now is not right next to the traffic. Uh, and it has a two-way bikeway, which uh, allows more bikes to travel this way. This is how I go if I'm going to Fresh Pond. This is the route I would take. And I think a lot of other people travel this way if they're going to Fresh Pond or to the Fresh Pond Mall. Um, we also propose this raised crosswalk uh, in order to welcome people into this area um, and, uh, and slow cars down as well. And again, the Ringe Towers being right here. Um, it's also the habitat that is created by having trees uh, and all the benefits that trees bring, which I'm guessing everybody here knows, but uh, water absorption, air purification, uh, habitat for, for creatures and birds, especially shade, uh, and probably the most important uh, relief from Heat Island, which is clearly coming. Uh, I mean, I grew up in Cambridge and a 90 degree day was a rarity, 100 never happened. Uh, and, Obviously, that's happening more and more, and the projections are a little scary of where we're going. So, uh, as, as somebody once said, the best time to plant a tree uh, was 20 years ago. The next best time is today. Um, and these trees we're showing are pretty young, so uh, these would grow much bigger. And in the next picture, I'll show you what it would look like in 20 or 30 years, perhaps, when we have a full canopy along Ringe Ave. Um, and again, uh, the bikeway, uh, the sidewalk, the nature path, and the wetlands. And I just want to say, just say that this is a proposal and it's, it's for discussion. We're not telling people that it has to be this. I think there's room for, for you know, changing it, but this really shows you sort of how, how great a space could be created if, we, if we're, we put our minds to it and we want to do this. It's really about will. Um, and you know, there's something to do with, uh, with money in there probably as well. Uh, but let's remember that uh, the labs uh, that they're building on the north part of the site are uh, projected to be worth about $1.1 billion. Um, and that's based on uh, a comparable from across Elbife Brook Parkway. So there's a billion dollars of development happening on the north part of the site. And we hope that uh, a really great solution can happen on the south part of the site next to Ringe Ave. Um, this is from the Envision Cambridge uh, planning process. Uh, which uh, I think a few people here uh, on the call were uh, participated in in one way or another. I was on the uh, uh, Alewife working group. Uh, and one of the things that came out of this was, yes, it's possible to reshape a pond and create an accessible 
area. And uh, to the extent that uh, city plans mean anything, uh, I think it means that there was at least a small bit of buy-in from the city on this idea, but without committing resources, um, uh, money or ownership or cleanup or, or all the caveats that the city would, would have on a place like this. Um, but there is, I think, a little bit of buy-in to the idea of renaturalizing the pond um, and making it accessible. So the, the view that I showed you before uh, of, of how we imagine the Rinjab side being that view being from like this way looking down uh, and then from a, right across uh, looking across the crosswalk, this is the plan view of it. And it shows you all the land that would be created. And then this is where the pond could be expanded. Um, now, this right here, these islands were proposed by a, a, a wildlife uh, ecologist from a, a wildlife sanctuary, Manomet, in, in Plymouth, Mass, uh, on the Cape. Um, and he said that this is an ideal habitat for, for roosting birds. Uh, and we have the heron trees, which are up here, which probably many of you are familiar with. There's been a rookery there for I think about four or five years. Um, I, I want to say right here that uh, any work that would be done to do this would be outside of heron nesting season. And I've been assured again by Manomet and also by Audubon, uh, Mass Audubon, that that would not disturb the herons. In fact, it would create a better landscape and better ecosystem for them, as long as the work takes place outside of the nesting season. And also, you know, creating these, these islands is a really great additional habitat that they don't have today. Um, so that's kind of a, an overview of it. Uh, if you uh, take a look from the aerial view, this is what it looks like today. And then you can kind of flash between the two uh, examples. You can see how this is widened. Uh, and then you can see how the pond is expanded on this side uh, compared with this, what it looks like today. Now, one little hint here that and I'll talk more about this, uh, this area actually in here is highly degraded. Um, it's paved uh, a lot of it and had uh, commercial uses. There was a fast food restaurant here and then a little further up there were metal fabrication company. So <clears throat> despite the fact that it looks like this uh, natural area or pristine natural area, it's actually filled with pavement and uh, retaining walls, uh, unfortunately. And so I think that by uh, creating a wetland there, you can actually remove some of that pavement and create a, a better landscape. And again, I want to I want to talk. Uh, we can get more into the, the details on this, but the the, the pollution obviously is is a, a major concern, and, and any work here would have to be done under uh, Cambridge laws. There's an asbestos ordinance, and and there's also an activity and use limitation on the property, which says what you can and can't do. So any any digging you would do here would have to be under those strictures. Uh, but again, uh, the the history suggests that there actually was a fast food joint here and not a factory, and uh, and folks uh, uh, who've been following this site for a long time, the uh, licensed site professional LSP from Haley and Trich have said she thinks it's unlikely there's pollution here, but it would have to be tested. And again, anything would, that occurs there would have to happen under the strictures of the activity and use limitation in these asbestos ordinance. Um, this is what IQHQ has proposed along Ring Um And we look at it, it's a pretty nice rendering. Um, it's not bad, it's really better than what's there today. But what it doesn't have is a regeneration uh, and a, a renaturalization of the pond bank. It doesn't create that large tree canopy. It doesn't have off-road bikeway. It's really a, almost like a balcony on a pit. Um, I, I joke that they should put a diving board here, but uh, there's deep water here. So you're basically, uh, in fact, putting people at risk. If anybody were to fall in, they'd be falling into deep water. Uh, if you have a sloped bank, uh, basically a marshy area here, then uh, you can't really fall into deep water. You'd have to wade you know, up to your knees first <laughs> before you fell into any water at all. Uh, but uh, this keeps the deep water very close to where people are moving back and forth through the landscape. So I think there's a safety concern here. And also it doesn't include, again, all that great habitat and uh, space for people. Uh, they've moved a little bit. Um, so they've proposed cantilevering this further over the water. Um, and uh, uh, moving the trees a little bit in, uh, which now means the shade would be cast potentially here. Uh, due south is on this side. So uh, the more trees you can get uh, to the south of where people are, uh, the better and more shade you're gonna provide and the more heat island relief. Uh, if you look um, at what's underneath uh, a cantilevered deck like that, it might look something like this. This is, I, I don't know that it will look like this, but this is a similarly cantilevered 
uh, deck. This is the Alewife Garage. Uh, and this is a uh, rip wrap, I think it's called, to stabilize the bank. Uh, under there, you can't see them, but there's columns. Uh, so any deck that was built like this is going to have to have columns all the way down. That's about 325 feet. There's going to be columns uh, dug into the pond bank uh, all the way along here. So it's not like we're comparing leave it alone or do our plan. It's really comparing against what are we doing to the pond bank here? Uh, and is, is it better to naturalize it and use earth or is it better to do something that's more like, uh, I would say more like a road or deck construction. And um, I think you know where I come out on that spectrum, but you know, uh, people can, can uh, fair-minded people can disagree on that, but I think that this is, I don't think you can really describe this as a wetland and I don't think you can really describe this as a renaturalization or regeneration of the pond bank. Um, again, just to remind you, this is, this is the proposal we have, which is really to use earth to create that space um, and then, and then uh, excavate out here to create, uh, to make sure that the wetland stays the same size. Um, and then the view of it uh, 20 or 30 years later once those trees are mature. Um, but reshaping a wetland is a big deal. Uh, we, we, don't, we didn't propose it uh, out of the blue without looking into it. And uh, we, we talked to three wetland experts. Uh, and the basic word is that if your purpose is ecological, fundamentally, then you will likely be permitted to do it because you are in sync with the purpose of the wetland protection laws. Uh, the purpose is to preserve wetlands. If you're improving a degraded landscape, uh, with pavement in the woods and you're creating a sloped bank wetland uh, with a marsh, marshy areas and uh, that area for aquatic plants, you are indeed improving the landscape. So uh, I don't think permitting is really uh, a problem ultimately. It may take a little longer to get permits. Uh, it's not clear that this actually requires the most stringent permit, which is our, an Army Corps permit um, uh, because it may not be connected to a federal waterway. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, what matters is what do people who know these permitting processes say, uh, and what they say is that it's very doable. And um, Allison Field Juma is also a resident of Cambridge, so she she knows this area well. When I first, uh, when we first went to thought of this idea, we I, I talked to Allison and I asked her if she thought this was a an idea she could endorse uh, to reshape the, the the pit into a pond, and she said not only could she endorse it, she would strongly endorse it. And that kind of gave us enough confidence to start uh, going a little further in our research and figuring out how you do this and what it might look like. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention that we, we don't work in a vacuum. We've been engaging with the community since we were founded six years ago. We've uh, worked with the Mayor's Youth Summer and Fall Employment Programs uh, regularly. Uh, here we are painting this historic fence along the parkway. I have a photograph of this I might show later from 1932. Um, and uh, some uh, fences uh, for some gardens we, we've been creating with them. Uh, this is the Mayor's Youth Fall Employment Program, but we also work, have worked with the Summer Employment Program regularly. In fact, they're, they're, they've been working on some of these gardens uh, just this week. Uh, these are native pollinator attracting perennial gardens, working with Meadowscaping for Biodiversity, a little organization that uh, works on, on those kinds of gardens. Uh, and we've basically reclaimed some spaces that were unused. Uh, these planters were overgrown with weeds. There are two of them on either side of this is Alewife Brook Parkway up here. Uh, and there's one on the other side. We've reclaimed those and planted them with uh, beautiful uh, pollinator attracting perennials. Um, here we are at our annual Earth Day event, uh, clean up out, outside of the fence. Uh, we've cleaned up, uh, I think for four or five years in a row. Uh, during COVID, we, we did it uh, more uh, remotely. Uh, but, uh, or on in small groups of people. Um, that's, sorry, I should mention, this is Mayor Siddiqui here, uh, who is uh, sort of welcoming everybody. Um, and uh, here we are much more recently, we've been to uh, the Ringe Towers uh, tabling and, and getting responses from people on some surveys on what kinds of things would they like to see there. And we've done that uh, in collaboration with the uh, Reservoir Church. Uh, this is Reverend Lydia Shu. Uh, and uh, they've been great. They, they do a lot of social justice work along Ringe Ave, um, and uh, including running Soccer Night, which is a great program at Russell Field, which I think is running uh, next week, maybe, or maybe this week, it's, it's soon. Um, and also uh, a life study group, a few members of that are, are here uh, uh, tonight and they've uh, attended. 
uh, and just to start, uh, the uh, affordable housing organization uh, has also participated. Um, so here we are collecting surveys. Um, and uh, these are just a few of the questions we asked. Uh, and you can see that there was pretty widespread support for uh, uh, doing some of the things we proposed. Uh, uh, more trees along Range Ave, uh, new park and gathering space along Range Ave. Uh, uh, this question is about the pathway along Elway uh, Brook Parkway. Uh, which is, uh, if you've ever walked down it, it's pretty unpleasant and narrow and not really safe for bikes and pedestrians. Uh, picnic areas, uh, off-street bikeways, um, and these get very high responses. And not surprisingly, uh, because they're things that a lot of people would want. Um, uh, we've gotten a little bit of attention uh, from uh, WBUR has done a couple stories and some of the local newspapers have done stories. Uh, this is the intern I mentioned, Anusha Alam. Uh, and uh, who's been helping us with engaging with the, the community. Um, and uh, this, I just, uh, I think I'll stop after uh, another minute and, and then we can go into some areas in a little bit more depth uh, if people want to. Uh, but this I just use for inspiration because it's, uh, it's one of uh, the treasures of the Emerald Necklace in Boston uh, showing that uh, nature can be created. Uh, this is Olmsted's uh, 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 Back Bay Fens under construction in 1892. Um, and so I think it's, it is doable. Uh, I think that there are precautions that uh, would be in place uh, and uh, that they should be closely monitored, but I think it is very doable. Um, and it's really a matter of will and desire to really improve the landscape, both for people and for nature. And I think we have the right developer uh, that we're working with because IQHQ has been just amazing, doing a lot of interesting stuff on other parts of the site, which I'm not getting into because uh, this they're not particular to Jerry's Pond, but I will mention that um, they are doing uh, biosolar on the roofs of some of their buildings. They're doing green roofs. Uh, they're doing lead gold buildings uh, and uh, a community farm, which we proposed uh, a few years ago, which I think Green Cambridge will run, uh, a tree farm uh, on the roof of the garage that they're building, uh, and a lot of great things. But I, I will say that all of those things do not really directly impact the lives of people who live right along Range Ave. And so I would not call a bio solar roof or green roofs or lead gold, I would not call that environmental justice. Uh, so I think what we're really working towards is much more just and equitable outcome uh, for people along Range and for nature. And again, I think IQHQ is a great partner. Uh, this is just a little bit of their uh, language uh, from, their, uh, from their website. Uh, which uh, I, I, I think they've been living it and, and we wanna see that they, they uh, continue uh, in that frame. Uh, I will stop sharing for the moment. Uh, if we wanna get into a little bit more about what it means to reshape a pond, uh, I'm glad to get into that. I have some pictures and I can talk about why we chose uh, the Southwest corner uh, as the location uh, and what some of the his particular history is there. I did mention there was a fast food location uh, and uh, so we can get into that after, but I think it's good to just open it up. And uh, if people have questions or comments, uh, uh, I think now would be a good time to start on that. And I think maybe Deb or Jacob, you're gonna, you're gonna do that. Uh, is that how it works? Or you want people to raise their, ra raise their virtual hands or their real hands, or how do you wanna do that? It'd be great if people would raise their virtual hands. Um, there's a couple questions in the chat, but just really quickly before we go, I wanted to ask, you had mentioned when I had spoken with you about a kind of a science center for local, um, you know, local people. And I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that as part of the, part of the idea. Sure, sure. Well, uh, we were fortunate that um, three different Audubon board members uh, introduced uh, us, uh, were introduced to us in, I think it was in March. Uh, and, it turns out that Audubon has shifted their mission towards uh, creating equitable green spaces uh, and urban sanctuaries. Uh, and for somehow or other, three board members had heard about the work we were doing uh, and uh, almost simultaneously in the same week uh, introduced me uh, to the president of Mass Audubon. Uh, and so uh, it, I would not call it a done deal, but. Um, we have now had, I believe, four meetings uh, with Audubon and the developer IQHQ, uh, and including on-site walk, walking around the pond. And IQHQ has proposed a pavilion, uh, which we're calling an eco-center, 
uh, probably on the east side of the pond near where the field house uh, and Russell Field are, but in the woods where you wouldn't be directly on the path. And they've proposed, uh, and they do, they run these kinds of programs in other locations already, but they've proposed educational programs starting as early as preschool. Uh, and by the way, there's a new preschool that will be built right across the street in, uh, in one of the Ringe Towers is adding, uh, putting an addition on it and there'll be a new preschool there. So there'll be kids right there. Um, and uh, the programs would go all the way up through high school. The older kids will be teaching the younger kids and will actually have paid internships um, and college readiness programs uh, and just a whole range of uh, environmental education place-based education and really bringing kids into nature. And it fits right in with, with Audubon's uh, uh, new program, uh, new mission. And I think it's actually uh, really great for IQHQ also because they don't run, they're, they're a developer of labs, they're not running educational programs. So to have a partner like Audubon could be really great. Um, I think it's fairly likely it will happen, but it, it isn't it isn't a formal partnership yet. But again, there've been some good meetings and really good signs that, um, that it will happen. So I'm, I'm gonna find some wood and, on, and knock on it soon, uh, but I think it, it would be great for, for all of Cambridge. And by the way, they're already working in some of Cambridge schools. So I think there will be some connections to the schools as well. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, so I'm gonna start with the questions from the chat, but I'm gonna um, just ask people if you've got other questions that you wanna just ask in the reactions bar, the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, you'll find a raise hand button that you can do if you wanna um, ask a question. Um, but I saw there's a couple of questions from Robert Kearns around the permitting process. I know that um, Eric addressed that a little bit, but Robert, do you wanna come off mute and just uh, ask your questions if you didn't quite get your answers? Sure. I was just wondering if you all have looked into um, Division of Ecological Restoration's uh, priority projects as a way to help fund it and to get technical support for the city and for the um, property owner, because they, they've done some of the work on some wetlands restoration. That's a super question. And actually, I met with uh, the director, uh, Beth Lambert, uh, about two years ago, she lives in uh, Cambridge off of Oxford Street. We had a nice coffee at, at Bourbon Cafe in Porter Square. And she said, the problem isn't money. The problem is the will to do something like this. So she was very positive about the potential for uh, state and federal funding for this. I am certainly not an expert in that. Uh, but, you know, I, I have actually put out the feelers to try to get some help with that. Um, and uh, I actually recontacted Beth yesterday. <laughs> so uh, hopefully uh, there, there's some potential, but I also know that um, Councillor Nolan spoke with her and she was a little less optimistic about funding uh, last summer or fall when they met. Uh, so it's hard to say, you know, if an infrastructure bill is passed um, federally, there may be, you know, significant new funds. I mean, this covers a lot of bases. It's Brownfields restoration. It's environmental justice. It's natural regeneration. Uh, there's, you know, a couple of big areas that it covers. So I do think it's fundable, and whether that's state, federal, or private foundation, and or city, uh, I think that remains to be seen. Or maybe it's a combination. And let's not leave off um, IQHQ, which is already spending a significant amount of money with their proposed deck along Ringe Ave. Uh, so if you think about moving that pot of money to a more ecological solution, that might cover all of it. For all we know, we're getting some pricing actually, but it might cover half of it. It might cover three quarters. We don't know yet. Uh, we hope it covers a significant part of it and, and perhaps they would uh, uh, put some more money into it as well. So I think there's a bunch of funding sources that could be tapped uh, and it remains to be seen uh, exactly where that would go. I think uh, since Councillor Nolan has her hand up and can talk a little bit about city funding, that might be a good place to go next. That's great, Councillor Nolan. Thank you. Yes, I had my hand up partly to just say we all on the council, I know Councilor Carlone is here, support this work. And the mayor, who I think can't be here, as Eric knows, has been here from day one and been really, really pushing to see what it is that we can do. On the funding side, the city does have some funding. This is a combination of it's the public sidewalk, but the property itself is owned by the developer. and. There would be, uh, I'm sure, as we've talked, reticence on the part of the city to figure out what exactly how some kind of partnership would work. If that was the 
it's a specific question on the funding, but in terms of pushing us, you know, the city, that's, this is part in advocacy. You might be um, working towards uh, having us work with the city manager to do more on that sidewalk because that is the part of the site that is controlled by the city. You know, we're happy to work on that. We're also pretty thrilled that because already the Friends of Jerry's Pond and Sierra Club and many of you on this call have advocated pretty strongly, IQH, the owner has actually moved far along in terms of some of the environmental changes that were made to ensure safety of the, of the site as well as frankly having a better plan than, than had initially been proposed. I don't know if you wanted any more specifics on that. You know, we are certainly working on it. I know the mayor has talked to the city manager. I've talked to the city manager and we're waiting to see what it is that the IQHQ and the city, how they can work together with uh, the neighbors on, on taking it to the next steps of either a reshaping of the pond or an improvement certainly of the, of the crosswalk there. I would just, just add that um, there, it may be, uh, it may be a policy order in a, a future council meeting. So stay tuned for that. Uh, basically- I'm not sure ask, whether to mention that or not. That's okay. Well, it, it, I said maybe, so. <laughs> uh, and uh, basically really asking the city to contribute to the public realm on Ringe Ave. So that's really the sidewalk, the off-road bikeway, the canopy, the stuff that is clearly gonna be used by the public um, and, uh, uh, I will say that the, the city has the city structure, so not the city council, but the administration has been very reluctant to, to get near Jerry's Pond, literally. Uh, but we're, we're not asking for them to take any ownership position at all, nor to do any cleanup work. So it's really strictly about providing funds and or work to build the public infrastructure, which will be used on a day-to-day -day basis by, by people uh, going along Ringe Ave. So that's really, that's a pretty specific ask of the city. And I think it's yeah. I think it's a fair ask given how much capital improvement has gone into other parts of the city. It would be nice to see a little bit more happen here. And just so let me add, so all you know, we're also working, the Cambridge Redevelopment Authority has also been involved in trying to seek more connectivity in this area, which is really critical. They are a very important player in this realm of things and have taken a holistic approach to understanding connectivity through the region. Thanks so much. Um, and the other thing that I wanted Eric to address, and then we'll go right to David, is just about the um, displacement protections from the current um, affordable housing places, you know, uh, residents in the neighborhood. Like, just I just want, like, I just wanted you to just address like how long these affordable housing units are to stay affordable housing units and, and uh, you know, to make sure that if we make this neighborhood have this beautiful resource that the people who live there now get to keep enjoying it. Um, so my understanding is, I'm not an expert in this, but that the three Ringe Towers are either have all been protected, they were so-called expiring use uh, and I know one of them, the one, the, the one closest to the parkway, which is now owned by Justice Start, is basically permanently affordable housing. Um, the two other towers are owned by a private company, and I think that they, there is now a plan to permanently uh, preserve them. Uh, and then the, the federal and state housing projects are uh, Jefferson Park are, uh, are also essentially you know, permanently preserved. So we sort of benefit from the fact that there, this is already, I think the highest concentration of affordable housing in the city. Um, it's about 4,000 residents, we figure between all of the developments and that it's essentially permanently protected. Um, so I think it is, you know, and there's actually more being built. I mentioned that a new building with a, a new preschool, there's gonna be a new building at the corner of Ale Life Brook Parkway and, and Ringe Ave. Um, so I think there's more housing being built, but thank you for that question. Wonderful. Um, David Hyman. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, I saw like different, uh, just, you know, different projects for a IQHQ on Ringe Avenue and what uh, you, Eric, talking about on Ringe Avenue, and they're different. Uh, is the difference simply a matter of scope or just one thinking one way and the other, the other way, or does IQHQ have concerns or oppositions to the uh, bike lanes and the swales and so on? Good question. Um, so I mean, one person, one friend of mine said, well, they're, they're, they know about construction. So they, they build things and decks 
and balconies are construction. You know, they're sitting on pilings that are drilled or, or, or driven into the earth and they're physical hardscape. Uh, and they don't know as much about ecological restoration, which, which Robert mentioned, but it turns out there's actually some incredible expertise in ecological restoration in this state. In fact, we're talking right now to the contractor that restored Blair Pond, which is at the Belmont edge of, of the alewife. Uh, that, that company specializes in ecological restoration and is working on some price estimates. So it could be a lack of familiarity with, with ecological restoration. It could be a concern about a cost differential, although they haven't actually provided a cost differential. And, and then importantly, I mentioned that all of this is under the asbestos ordinance and it may be concerns that what happens if we do find asbestos there uh, what will be the cost of mitigating it and how will we do that? So my, my position on that is let's see if there is or isn't. I think the, the, the record so far, the, uh, there's been some silt testing of, of the pond and it hasn't shown asbestos on that side of the pond um, and very little uh, on the north part. So that aligns with the uh, photography that I showed of, of uh, uh, there's no factories around that part of the pond and it was a fast food place. Um, so I think that we should be fact-based and look at and actually see tests for that side of the pond and see what's there. So it may be that, you know, I don't think we should stop something based on a, a potential. I think we should do it based on, on facts. So I think that the permitting is, is actually the last thing is that it may take some more time on permitting. But I will say that um, last week was the first time that they showed some openness to uh, basically separating the permitting for the buildings from what happens along Rin Jav, which I think is a positive development. Um, and also that they suggested for the first time that they would uh, look at what the cost might be. So I think there is, you know, I think there is some potential. And I think if we can help bring money, resource, resource and other resources to the table, it will help. Um, but so that's a complicated uh, answer to your question, but it's a, a very good question is, you know, what are the obstacles and why, why are they not just jumping at this idea? Honestly, I think if they did this, the, the headlines would practically write themselves. Uh, you know, uh, Brownfield, formerly polluted by W.R. Grist, restored by developer in, you know, who partners with Audubon on educational programs. It's really a pretty, could be a great story. So, but thank you for your question. Thanks, Eric. And now the Councillor Carloni, if you could uh, come off mute and address the crowd. Thank you, Deb and Eric. Uh, I was going to suggest what Eric just said. It's good news for the developer to do the right thing. I did a lot, of, as Eric knows, I did a lot of design review for the city years ago and, and did the master plan for East Cambridge. And some of those open spaces were built by the developer. And you, you and I think it's probably too late for that. The city should have been more aggressive but I'm fairly confident that this developer is coming back for phase two. And when they come back for phase two, that's an upzoning. And we've put in effect in Cambridge that anybody who comes for an upzoning has to pay for the increased value. And that increased value could pay for doing um, the pond the right way. Um, also, and I'm sure all of you know this, Cambridge is very deficient in open space as a city. We have 50% of the average city in the United States. And um, I've been speaking to Louie about another location. And um, there are always ways for different money can be used. Uh, federal money would not be city money community development funds, uh, even the um, Community Preservation Act money is different than city tax money. Um, so it's more of a commitment and I can't, as Patty mentioned, Councilor Nolan mentioned, I can't imagine anybody voting against doing everything we could on the council. And, and finally, a new manager's coming in, in a year, and um, perhaps the more conservative view on funding will have a transformation. Um, so 
when I, we did the Lechmere Canal, everybody said, oh, isn't that nice? It'll never happen. Well, you keep at it. And thank God there's a group that you all are that are pushing for it because we just have to keep pushing. It will happen. So congratulations. Thank you, Councillor Carlone. Uh, you've been a, a good ally. And I, we had a nice walk around the pond, I think maybe two years ago, talking about this. Uh, we certainly come a long way. And I think we're, in some sense, I feel like, uh, I don't know if you've read books about Mount Everest, but I feel like we're at the Hillary step. <laughs> That's where the crowd, you know, it's like that last little bit. Uh, and, it, and But I, I think that IQHQ is the right group to be the right company. Um, I do think you, you mentioned sort of the phase two thing. And I think one of the things that I, I didn't mention already is that uh, we, friends of, of Jerry's Pond and also uh, Ale Life Study Group, who's a couple of members are here, uh, both uh, all agree that there should be long-term protections for, for Jerry's Pond. Uh, so whether that's deed restrictions or uh, conservation easements or, or otherwise, that we want to make sure that this, this doesn't become a future building site uh, like every other open space in, in Cambridge is threatened by. So that's really important. Uh, and maybe even Audubon, after they're there for a couple of years and after we have a formal partnership, maybe they help participate in creating that, that long-term stewardship uh, so that it's protected uh, for future generations. And, and if I could just add, it'll be critical. When you have an MBTA headhouse, you ideally want some active use around it for security and activity, a restaurant overlooking the pond. So um, that's why I know, no one's told me, I just know at, from as being a, an urban designer, that's much too valuable land for them to leave. Now, maybe it's 20 years out, but they will do something there. And that's when you grab them. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm, I, I, I'd like to plant those trees uh, next year and not wait 20 years. But um, I do think that there, there will be potential for future uh, expansion of their project, which I'm not sure the neighborhood will be happy about. <laughs> but, uh, and I think that, I mean, I just heard from so many sources that this kind of project is very fundable. Uh, and I do think that IQHQ could put more into it and, and may already be putting a very significant sum into RINJAB. So uh, my only pushback there, Dennis, is, is that let's do it now and not wait. Uh, and let's get state, let's get city, state, federal funding, uh, potentially private foundation and also IQHQ funding. And let's plant those trees now because Heat Island is coming. It's only getting worse. We want those trees planted, you know, in the next year or two so that in 10 or 20 years, they're, they're significant. Uh, so anyway. I'm, Please I'm, understand, I'm not talking yeah. about building out phase two. I'm not saying fill up the site. I'm saying selectively, but if you have private money, you're gonna get public money. And that's what we did in East Cambridge. That's public, yep. private, and that helps enormously. Thanks, I'll be quiet now. No, no, that's good, thanks. You're on mute, Deb. I'm on mute. Okay, so we've got, got only about five minutes left of the, of, on that, or seven minutes left, so. Um, uh, but I see Mike uh, Nakagawa is on to ask a question. Mm. Um, I want to thank Friends of Jerry's Pond for paying a lot of putting a lot of time and effort into <laughs> bringing attention to our our corner of the woods and and uh, coming up with visions of what could be done and and um, really <clears throat> we've pushed a lot with IQHQ for. Um, getting a lot of things that they've been working on boardwalks through around their perimeter and they go through the woods and and um, and like the nature center putting a place for that and and make, making it look nicer I think one big thing that when the chain link fences will go down uh, people feel a lot better um, uh, when that happens um, one thing I'd like to point out about the the interactions of the filling and the contamination. So right now, with we're, everything is kind of in place, um, but because it's a flood zone, um, if we fill in part of the pond, that would require digging. And we do know that there are areas of the perimeter of the pond um, that if those areas were chosen, there has been asbestos 
um, found in soil from previous testing. So it would take some, I mean, there are areas that could be uh, um, removed uh, or for or the filling and the, the removal. Um, and we just need to be careful. Um, but um, I'm, I'm also, uh, I have various roles in the city, but I'm, I'm the vice president of Alewife Neighbors Incorporated, which is a 501c3 that has been, uh, we've been hiring over time, um, environmental consultants of various sorts, hydrogeologists, um, um, contamination experts, uh, and wetlands experts. And I, I just feel it's, I have to bring up um, that we recently hired a very respected uh, wetlands consultant, Matt Weisberg, um, who's been on the um, Board of Conservation Commissioners and, and it's an advisory group, the national one too. Um, and he, when we asked about different options for going around the site, um, he wasn't quite as um, um, enthusiastic about changing what's there. He felt that um, leaving it alone was best, which kind of surprised me because I had mentioned the, the sloped banks and, and, um, and marshy areas. And he thought that that wasn't necessarily the best thing to do, that, um, um, that leaving it alone might be because it has come back to some sort of ecosystem of its own. Uh, nothing is really natural there. And, um, but pond edges are just different. They're not necessarily better or worse. And so I don't, so in terms of that, it just saying that there's some difference of opinion from, from the experts we, we hired. Oh, um, that's super interesting. I'm sorry, I'm gonna wrap you up because there's still one more person that wants to ask questions. We only have a few minutes left, but thank you so much, Mike. And that is interesting. I'm sure it's, I'm sure that it'll be a healthy uh, community discussion on how best to, to handle, um, to, you know, making that piece of property a more interactive property for the neighborhood. I just wanted quickly to, to let uh, Joel speak before uh, the hour ends, so. Um, Thank you very much. I'll be try to be very quick. Um, again, I, I also want to appreciate Eric and Friends of Jerry's. They've done a, a lot to uh, highlight and promote uh, more public access and restoration at the Jerry's Pond area, and they've played a really good role. I'm I'm a sort of an abutter. I live right next to Russell Field, next to the pond uh, in the site, and I've been with Elwise Study Group for 26 years since we started, and we've played a big role in. Um, bringing uh, to awareness the asbestos contamination and played a role in the AUL activity use limitation and the asbestos protection ordinance and so on and so forth. And we've been meeting with uh, IQHQ uh, proactively since mid-February and uh, Friends of Jerry's and some other groups have joined us in April and we have accomplished a lot. Um, I, so there's not enough time to say all the other things that would be useful, but I'll say that I put in the chat uh, the website uh, that IQHQ has for this site. And you can see not their most recent plan, but relatively recent um, that they presented at the end of May. And they've made some more changes in response to the community since then. But in terms of evaluating, uh, they've, you know, if they've made a lot of proposals in response to Friends of Jerry's and LY Study Group and others to provide public access on all sides of the pond that balances the, uh, make protection and improvement of the habitat and the wetlands. And so I encourage uh, members of the Sierra Club to look at their full set of proposals. Um, and I think that in terms of uh, uh, the rent that they actually have two gateway parks on the Southwest and Southeast side of uh, Rinj Ave. So really what's all in question, the only thing that's in question is sort of the center part of Rinj Ave where it's narrower. And they have committed to making design changes to include at least a one-way bike lane along Ringe Ave. So it's still a, a work in progress. And it's definitely kind of a question of uh, sort of choosing priorities among a different set of options for the cost. One thing that they said is like burying the utilities uh, along the sidewalk could perhaps be a five to $6 million cost. Uh, so that I think one of the things that Elway study group tries to look at is what are the different options if you have to spend like $10 million um, 
you know, what would be good for the site, what would be good for the community, and a couple of things that we've been advocating for um, from the city, from who, whoever is, um, is a underpass from uh, Jefferson Park or the, near the Ringe Towers to Danahy Park, which would give that affordable housing community access to Danahy Park, which would greatly increase the environmental justice. Um, so that I think that should be considered in the mix in terms of whatever pot of money. If we can get enough money to do all of it, great. But the other thing that we're encouraging IQHQ to do is to play a supportive role in getting a commuter rail stop at Alewife, which would increase access to employment um, and sustain in the, you know, environmentally um, sound transportation for the members of the affordable um, housing community, as well as others. So um, we're trying to look at the full mix. And if there's enough money to do uh, the Friends of Jerry's plan, plus all these things, that would be great. But we kind of want to look at how much money there is from IQHQ and the city and whoever else and see what would be good. Um, they have committed to not developing the other parts of their site. And they have you know, rest, they have uh, what, you know, habitat restoration on different parts of those sites. So I encourage people to look at their plans to uh, see their sort of the full picture of what they're proposing and, and then we can go from there. Thank you. You're, you're on mute. Jeff. I'm muted again. Thanks so much, Joel. Uh, we're over time here, but I wanted to end with just asking Eric if there's anything that you can recommend that Sierra Club our Sierra Club members do to support uh, your project at this time. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Joel and, and Mike, for, for filling in some of the Sorry, I, I struggled with how much could I talk about today uh, and uh, just chose to focus on the Jerry's Pond part of the site. Um, but in terms of what people can do, I think that um, if, you know, if Sierra Club supports this idea of ecological restoration, then you know, it's always helpful to have endorsements from other in environmental groups and, and for people who live in Cambridge specifically, um, if it is on the city council on August 2nd or in early uh, September, then uh, you can show up and give public comment uh, or write an email if you don't have time to Zoom or, or show up in person there. Um, and uh, if you happen to have a foundation with uh, a couple million dollars you want to gift to uh, an environmental restoration project, uh, uh, Deb will give you my email address. <laughs> Thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate it. Um, it's, it's been a fun discussion. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. This has really been an amazing um, conversation. And I, I uh, encourage folks to reach out to Sierra Club to let us know about events in your community uh, that we want to help uh, get the word out about. So thanks so much. And thank you, Eric. And uh, have a wonderful rest of your evenings, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Good night.